questions are welcome. Technical, basic, whatever. Okay. Any questions to start? So there are different, um, s most people are in their last year of undergraduate, but there's some people earlier who are here. So again, don't feel embarrassed. I mean, obviously, I assume you have had a course in quantum mechanics and special relativity, and of course, classical mechanics. But other than that, um, don't assume, I don't assume you've seen field theory or general relativity or um, anything, anything more technical, okay? Okay, um, so so supersymmetry people use the word Susie for, so sometimes I'll use this one. Um, so it's a symmetry that So the first thing I have to tell you is what are bosons and fermions. So probably everybody thinks they know what bosons and fermions are, but, but maybe it's not so obvious. So supersymmetry is a specific symmetry that relates. I'll say more specifically what I mean by this later. But uh, right now I want to say a little bit about what I mean by bosons and fermions. So bosons are um, fields. So fields in general can take different values at different points in space or space-time. And the values they take are ordinary numbers, okay? Sometimes they can be real numbers, sometimes they be complex numbers, but they're the numbers that you all know and, and satisfy the usual properties that if you have two numbers and you multiply them in different orders, they cancel, right? So they're called commutative. Now, if you've taken a course on quantum mechanics, which I assume everybody has taken, you know that when you quantize, sometimes things stop commuting. So you have things like this, x. So these are bosons, x. Okay? But you could also have fields which are bosons. So you have relations like this. Where this is the Minkowski metric. So Minkowski metric, at least in the notes, so sometimes I switch conventions, but at least I'll try to keep the conventions in which it's minus one plus one plus one. Plus. So in this case, if you take x right, x let's say in the one direction and p in the one direction, and you s switch the order, it's no longer zero, okay? So this would be something like ih bar. But at least classically they're commuted. Okay, so what are bosons? So ordinary variables that you learn in classical mechanics are bosons, okay? You can also have fields which are bosons, like the Higgs boson is obviously a boson, so it's a scalar. Other bosons, I'll write down photon. Another boson is the graviton. Um, if you know something about um, quantum chromodynamics or even the electroweak force, there are also bosons called let me call it vector bosons. These are responsible for the weak force, so you can also have gluons. Maybe I'll call it. So these are the fields. This is Higgs. These are some fields that we have in, in particle physics, which are bosons. Okay. And Everybody knows how to work with these objects because you've learned 
You've, you've done this since kindergarten, okay? But now fermions. So fermions, they satisfy a different kind of property. Let me call, I'll use um, Greek instead, I guess Greek instead of Latin. So instead of being commutative, they're anti-commutative. So it means that if you switch the order, you get the minus sign. Okay? So classically, they're anti-commutative. Now, when you quantize, is, I'm not going to obviously discuss this in detail, but when you quantize, they can sometimes satisfy a relation something like this, psi m, psi bar n. They're different ones. They could have something like this. This is just an example. So um, in this case, Although classically, they would anti-commute. In this case, when you quantize, they don't anti-commute. Okay? So you would have something like psi 1, psi bar 1, plus psi bar 1, psi 1. In this case, it would be minus psi. Like this one. Okay. So again, you have to distinguish between classically and quantum mechanically. But when I say a fermion, I automatically mean that it's classically anti-commute. So there's some examples. So if there weren't examples, there'd be no point in discussing them because um, physics is only interested in examples. And there are fields which um, are fermions in nature. So this would be, for example, an electron. I can think of, I'm just writing a symbol, but you could have a positron, for example. Other, I'll, I'll just give a different letter, but okay, chi would be a quark, for example. And there are also fields like neutrino. So these are some fields, you'll hear something about these, of course, in the particle physics lectures. You could also have anti-quark. Positron is an anti-electron, so I'm not going to, oh, I can write it like this, anti-electron. Could also have anti-neutrino. So these are some of the fermions which exist in, in nature. Um, you can see that the indices that I put on these are different than the indices I put on here. Here I put uh, um, an index M, which stands for an index in space-time. So M, at least in four dimensions, would go from 0 to 3. So it's a vector index. This index alpha, at least in the notation I'll use in our lectures, will go from 1 to 2, and it's called the spinner index. Now, probably about halfway through the lecture, I'll tell you what the spinner is. I'm not going to try to teach you what spinner is now. But it's a representation of the Lorentz group, just like a vector is a representation of the Lorentz group. Now, these all have what's called spin 1 half. Okay? And you might confuse, many people do confuse, a fermion with something of spin 1 half, or half integer spin. That's not the definition which I'm going to use. The definition I'm going to use is this, okay? And in fact, there are fermions of integer spin, which are not so common, but are useful. For example, there's a field called the ghost. If you study Yang-Mills, which is a fermion, but it turns out to not have any index, so it's a spin zero, in the same way like the Higgs boson is spin zero. So probably... Many of you have heard about what's called spin statistics theorem, that fields of integer spin are bosons and fields of half integer spin are fermions. 
Okay, so that's a theorem, but it's only a theorem for f physical states. So the ghost, just by the name, you figure that it's not physical, is not something you're going to see in an experiment. Okay, so there's a spin statistics theorem which relates these. Which so this would be integer spins. This would be half integer spins for physical states. But, but in some sense, that's a theorem that you can prove, but it's certainly not the definition of a fermion. Okay. Okay, any questions? Yeah? Of 8MN? Um, so this is the time... Yeah, so he's asking, what's the interpretation of this minus one? So when I write down a matrix with four entries, I can call this one, two, three, four, or zero, one, two, three. I could have called this four. Some people call the time direction four. But this is just uh, the component of, of um, the matrix with the first entry. So zero is just the first row. I don't know if that was the... That was So, so, um, so, you're asking if I quantize? So, yeah, I think I can answer your question. So, x0 is like t, right? c times t. It turns out that p0 is like Hamiltonian, so uh, energy. So, h, or energy, is like ddt. So, that's, I don't know if that was your question. That answers your question? Any other question? Yeah. Yeah. Just to point out that we have there the Galarian spectral mutation relationship, but uh, in quantum mechanics we don't have this time operator. Okay. So this is what I'm going to do in these lectures. Oh, sorry. Thanks. Okay. So <laughs> the question is, uh, in quantum mechanics normally you don't have a, uh, you don't work with relativity. You work with non-relativistic position and momentum. But there's a relativistic version of quantum mechanics in which, which we'll see actually today or tomorrow, in which uh, you actually quantize all of the degrees of freedom. Okay, so you're right. When you learn quantum mechanics, normally you learn non-relativistic quantum mechanics. But at least in these lectures, you're going to see the full relativistic version, which of course is necessary when you want to do quantum field theory. Any other questions? Okay, so. Uh, what do you do with fermions? So um, you're never going to measure a fermion because you have an experiment and it's never going to measure an alpha, right? You, do, you, don't <laughs> you can only measure 2.346. You can't measure a fermionic number. So um, the only way we know how to work with these, we means mathematicians, physicists, is we get rid of them. We integrate over them, okay? So for example, this object here can take a fermionic value. I should say there are two ways to work with them. One way is, of course, if you quantize, on this side of the equation, we have just an ordinary number. Okay? So one way is by quantizing, and then essentially you, you cancel the, or you, you exchange the anti-computing numbers for a commuting number. Okay? There's another way to get rid of it is to integrate over them. So essentially, Suppose I have a system which has, let's say, n of these anti-commuting numbers. Okay, so, so let's say we have... So these are n different anti-commuting numbers. What does anti-commuting mean? They all anti-commute with each other. So cap i with kappa j is equal 0 which means, for example, that kappa 1 squared equals kappa 2 squared equals... So in this sense, you can think of them as infinitesimal. You take the square, but it's not an ordinary infinitesimal. Okay? It's, um, it's something which is very small, but not necessarily... Uh, that doesn't mean it's you know, 0. 0.0000 something. Okay? But it means you can always do a Taylor expansion, and the Taylor expansion always ends. 
So for example, consider this Taylor expansion. So let's say we have kappas and kappa bars, which is actually something very common. And consider this object, e to the kappa i, kappa bar i, sum over i. So we can Taylor expand this. And the easy way to Taylor expand it is first write is So of course, all of these products are, you can't exponentiate a fermionic object. You can only exponentiate a normal object, okay, a bosonic object. But of course, the product of two of them is bosonic. So of course, we can separate it in this way as a usual exponential. And now we can Taylor expand each of these, and there's only one term, or two terms. So it's 1 plus kappa 1, kappa 1 bar, 1 plus kappa 2, kappa 2 bar. So that's something that, um, that's very convenient. Okay? And now we're going to define an integration over fermionic numbers. And essentially, the only thing we know how to integrate are polynomials in these objects, because you can't have 1 over a fermionic number. Or of course, you could also have these exponentials of these objects. Okay? So remember, for bosonic objects, Essentially, if you do anything beyond the harmonic oscillator, you just have Gaussian integration. Essentially, we don't know how to do anything else. So the way we're going to define integration over some function of these kappas is the following. We say d of kappa of a plus b kappa 1. a and b are just ordinary um, numbers. This is just going to be equal to b. Are in fact, uh, I have to be a little bit more specific. Let me write it like this. So if I have an arbitrary function of kappa, because I can Taylor expand, it only has two terms. Okay, so it's always a plus. So let's suppose f is a bosonic object. Then a has to be bosonic, and b has to be fermionic, right? Because the product of two fermions is a boson. I didn't say that, but, but I think it was clear from here. So if you have two anti-commuting numbers or any even amount of anti-commuting numbers, they commute. Okay? So sometimes people call them odd, and bosons is even for that reason. So if f is odd, or if f is anti-commuting, a has to be anti-commuting, and b has to be commuting. If f is even, or commuting, then a is commuting, and b has to be anti-commuting. Okay? And this formula is, is valid for all of them. Okay? This is some called, sometimes called Berezin integration. Now, as I mentioned, the only thing we're going, essentially going to, the only, well, we're not going to do many integrals in this class, but if you want to do quantum field theory, you have to figure out how to work with these objects, okay? So quantum field theory is built out of these fermionic fields. Of course, also out of the bosonic fields. And the way, we, uh, I don't know who to give a name to, but sometimes Feynman is given this name. The way we work with these things is by doing path integrals, okay? So we have to figure out how to do integrals over these objects. And there's something I should clear up before people get confused, which is this is not the wave function of quantum mechanics. Okay? So sometimes people think, oh, psi of x, because when you learn quantum mechanics, you, you have quantum mechanical wave functions, psi of x. So this is a wave function. And some, sometimes people say, well, this is just you know, the field of the electron, or something like that. It's not. Okay? This is a wave function whose values are complex numbers, okay? They're not, this is not a fermion, okay? So you have to be careful. When you talk about quantum mechanical wave functions, we're not talking about the field of the electron, okay? So sometimes people think this psi alpha of x is some quantum mechanical wave function. It's not. 
Okay, so how do we do this integral? So normally, one has to do a path integral over these psi's, and you have some action which depends on the psi's. And essentially what the path integral tells you to do is you're supposed to think of this as an integral over the value of psi at each point in space-time. And this action depends on some complicated function of the psi's and psi bars. But essentially what it comes down to is some kind of Gaussian integration. Okay? So essentially the only thing you have to know how to do is to do some integral of this type. So we're integrating over all the values, 1 to n. Of course, if you're doing quantum fields, n is infinite. And then you have this exponential. You have something like this. There and is, using there is this a, Nathan, there is a question here. Go ahead, please. Uh, that's just the name of the integration, yeah. yes. Yeah, so that's the wrong kind of question. So Maybe you could repeat the question. So the question is on what domain am I integrating? So you're asking me, well, in bosonic integration, I know how to, I know what the meaning of, of x is, right? It goes from 0 to 1, minus 3 to 5, right? In this case, there's no domain of integration. You should think of this as just some mathematical definition. In fact, one way to define this, which is completely consistent, is just to define this as a derivative with respect to kappa 1. So you can see that this formula is actually the same as d d kappa 1 of a plus kappa 1 b. So if you want to, you can actually think of Bayer's integration as just differentiation. And then you would, your question would not come up. Okay? So it's just a definition. Any other questions? Okay, so the question on chat is, what's the main difference between a quantum field and a wave function? So wave function, you learn in quantum mechanics, has these properties like it's normalizable and things like that. So you, you have these kinds of definitions and things like that. Quantum field is a, is a different object. I'm not going to teach quantum field theory here, but uh, they're different objects. So I don't think I want to answer the question in more detail than that. Um, Okay, any other question? Okay, so doing this integration using this rule is actually very simple. Because you see, the only term that's going to contribute is the term with all of these variables. And that comes just from this object here, right? So essentially, this is equal to the same integration. I'm not going to rewrite it. I've just kappa 1, kappa bar 1, kappa 2, kappa bar 2, kappa n, kappa bar n. Now, to do this integration, there's one subtlety, which is these integrals, you can think of them as derivatives. You want, they also anti-commute. Just like kappa 1 anti-commutes with kappa 2, dd kappa 1 anti-commutes with dd kappa 2. So in order to get um, the thing to, be, to give an obvious answer, you have to actually invert the order of these. So this is actually equal to the same integral, but now starting with kappa bar n, going to kappa bar 1, then kappa n to kappa 1. And then there's a coefficient here, which is either plus 1 or minus 1, because you have to switch the order of these. Okay? So this is going to be plus or minus. I'm not going to try to do the computation in my head. So it's plus or minus 1. Sorry for running out of space. Some other nice features of this is, suppose I do the same integration. I have this exponential. But now I put a kappa i here. Sorry, this is a different, let's call it kappa j. And you want to do that integral. So this object is fermionic. 
So this object here is obviously zero because the integral of a fermion, because here I'm integrating over some bosonic object. I have an even number of these. So this is zero. But suppose I have a kappa bar k here. So now I have a kappa j and a kappa bar k. Okay. So what does this give? So suppose j and k are different. If j and k are different, you can see from this integral here, you're obviously going to get zero because the only way to get all of the kappas is if it's some product of these. You can miss one of them, but if you miss one of them, it has to be from the same kappa n and kappa, kappa j and kappa j bar. So this is going to be equal up to signs to be equal to just delta jk. Okay. So that's something uh, natural. It says essentially that the, you, you would, of course, get the same um, you would you get the same answer if you were integrating over bosonic objects. So if you were doing a Gaussian integration and you had xj and x bar k, that would also give you zero, just because it's if you take x to minus x, it's going to it's going to cancel. Okay. Okay, so these are various manipulations you can do. Another nice feature is that delta of kappa is just equal to kappa. That's clear because delta of kappa times kappa is just kappa squared. So if I do the integral, for example, d kappa of delta kappa times f of kappa, what that's just going to give you is just f of 0. Question? So this you can try to work out as an exercise, for example. So these are manipulations that if you do them all the time, you'll get used to it, but the first time you see it, it's going to be strange. So these are things you people can do exercises about, and until you really know what the fermion is, there's no point in discussing supersymmetry, because, um, okay, any questions? Okay, so now the next thing I want to discuss is, I told you f supersymmetry is a specific symmetry. So it's a symmetry that relates these kinds of particles with these kinds of particles, but it actually is more general. It's, um, so any questions before I raise this? So now I'm going to use some symbols, which you're not going to understand at the moment. But um, it turns out to be a specific symmetry that relates both in fermions that generalizes Poincaré symmetry. So that's what I mean by specific. It's So the Poincaré symmetries are just translations and Lorentz rotations. Okay, so we they're denoted usually by the symbol PM and MMN. So these are of course the rotations and boosts. And these are of course the translations. So these form an algebra. So at least if you're working in flat space, translations commute with each other. So if you do a translation in one direction and commute it with a translation in another direction, the commutator is 0. Whereas the Lorentz rotations and the Lorentz boosts, they don't commute. If you do a Lorentz rotation in, in for example, a rotation in the, around the x-axis and a rotation on the y-axis, and you commute, you get a rotation around the z-axis. Okay? So the algebra of these is more complicated. So just to remind you, the rotations are m, j, k, j equals 1 to 3, and the boosts are m, 0, j. Okay? So I'm using the same notation where zero corresponds to the time direction. Okay. So these satisfy a relation of this type. 
This is anti-symmetric in M and N. So since M goes from 0 to 3, you have six of these, three rotations and three boosts. And you get, so if you've never seen this before, um, you should obviously look at any textbook on special relativity. Sorry, M. So this is anti-symmetric in M and N, so that forces this, and it also has to be anti-symmetric in P and Q, so that forces uh, anti-symmetric in P and Q. No, sorry, I already did that. Uh, anti-symmetric in M and N. That's this one. Okay. Okay, so once I know the first term, the sign of the first term, that automatically determines the signs of the other terms by just a symmetry property. Okay, finally you have a... a commutator with M and P. That comes from the fact that P under a Lorentz rotation transforms. Obviously, if you do a translation in the X direction and you do a rotation, that's going to give you a translation in a different direction. So again, I'm not sure about the signs, but it's going to be something like a to m n p p minus a to m p. Okay, so this is of course up to signs. Okay, okay again, if you haven't seen this before, um, look in a, any special relativity textbook. Any questions? Okay, so now we're going to generalize this. These are called um, if you like, bosonic generators, because it's always a commutation relation. When you do supersymmetry, you're going to have fermionic generators. So you're going to enlarge the Poincaré group to include extra generators. And in fact, this is actually the unique way to generalize the Poincaré group in a non-trivial way. Non-trivial means you can always add internal generators which commute with all the M's. So for example, electromagnetism has a U1 um, symmetry which of course commutes with Lorentz transformations. So you can always add internal symmetries. But if you want to add a symmetry which does not commute with the M's, it's essentially a unique way which preserves consistency. Consistency means that the theory is unitary. So the new object we're going to construct is called um, Q alpha. So it's called super Poincaré. And you add a generator Q alpha. In four dimensions, alpha goes from one to four. So we'll, we'll discuss the four dimensional case separately. But in general, one can have supersymmetry in any dimension. So this is called super symmetry. And in general, the These objects don't anti-commute, just like these objects obviously don't commute. And it satisfies an algebra of this type. So the anti-commutator of two supersymmetries is related to a, a translation where this is just a constant matrix. Nathan? <coughs> just one comment. I'm not sure everyone knows what the bracket symbol means. Oh, okay. So this symbol here, thanks. Is defined to be A B minus B A. This symbol here is defined to be A B plus B A. So this is just a warning to all of you. Don't be embarrassed to ask any kind of question, okay? Because obviously, if you didn't know this, you, you missed already the first 10 minutes. So, um, because any question you ask is probably shared by half of the audience. So, so don't be embarrassed. Any questions? <laughs> 
So there's another notation which I will sometimes use, which I don't expect you to know. But um, So sometimes if you have two objects with indices and you draw something like this, this means xm yp minus xp. So I'm not sure if I'm going to use that notation, but um, if you see this, this is what this means. Okay. Yes? So this is a matrix. So m goes from 0 to 3. Alpha and beta, in this case, goes from 1 to 4. So it's four 4 by 4 matrices. You'll see explicit specific examples of this very soon. Any other question? Yes, go ahead. Sh I'm sorry? Better to repeat the question. Or I, I didn't hear the question. Or I can give the microphone. You can just speak louder. Shouldn't it be an F of this? Half. Uh, OK, sorry. That's your definition. This is my definition. That's your definition. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, for your, when you do your talk, you can define it your way. I'm defining it this way. Any other question? Yes? Uh, just one more question. When you have that constant matrix, uh, is there any restraint to how it can be shaped and its deviation? Yes. So we'll, we'll talk about this later. But right now, it, it ha obviously has to be symmetric, because this is symmetric if I exchange alpha and beta. And it satisfies certain properties called the Clifford algebra, but I, I don't want to get into that right now. It's better to repeat the question. Yeah. So the question is if this has to satisfy some consistency property. So it's an excellent question. So let me say why it has to satisfy consistency property. It's because there's things called Jacobi identities. So if you take the commutator of Q with Q, and then you take the commutator again with Q, that has to vanish. So if you do it depending on the properties of the, of the indices. So there are certain consistency properties it has to satisfy, yes. But I don't want to get into that right now. But it's a good question. Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. What about what? This one? Yes. It's like this one. So if I switch the order of two, so this means first I do uh, Lorentz, for example, let's do an example. First I do a rotation around the x-axis, and then I rotation around the y-axis. So if I commute those two, if I first do the rotation around the y-axis and then the x-axis, I get a different answer. The difference is precisely a rotation around the z-axis. So that's what this commutator is telling me. So it doesn't so look like a square bracket. Oh, it doesn't look. Okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. So s usually I'll try to use the it's Latin But repeat, for repeat the question. The maybe. question is about the, la the, the notation. So I'll try to use Latin indices always to go from 0 to, sp so it's a vector index. So it goes from, in this case, in four dimensions from 0 to 3. In general, it goes from 0 to d minus 1. Whereas these Greek indices I'll usually re refer to as spinner indices. So um, depending on the dimension, it's different. So I'll try to keep that, but I don't promise. Any other questions? OK, so um, what I wanted to talk about uh, is how this transforms under Lorentz rotations. So I'm just going to write down an equation, but I don't expect you to understand it at the moment. But just like this transforms as a vector, so this is the definition of how a vector transforms under a Lorentz transformation. Well, I can also define how a spinner transforms. Okay, And it turns out to be. Turns out to be related to a product of gamma m times gamma n. I'm not going to tell you how to do the products at the moment. So this turns out to be something of this type. Sometimes it is a factor of a half or something like that. But in any case, this is the, um, so this is again a matrix. It's a constant matrix. 
And this essentially tells you that this transforms as a spinner representation of the Lorentz group. And we'll discuss examples later. But you should just un re remember that M rotates Q in the same way that it rotates P. I mean, it, it, not in the same way, but it rotates both of them. Okay. Finally, so, Sorry, can I make one comment? Nathan? Just one second. Let me just do one more. The final statement is that Q commutes with P. Go ahead. Sorry, uh, I just have a feeling that probably many people don't know what a representation is. You, are, you, are, you use this word twice, and I don't think it's common. Um, OK, so um, I think people know what a vector is, right? So you know how a vector transforms if you do a rotation. So that means a vector is a representation of, of the rotations. Okay. A tensor is a more general representation of rotations. A third representation of rotations is a spinner, which probably people, uh, many people have not heard about, but is necessary if you want to describe fermions like the electron. Okay, again, I can't give a theory on, I can't give electron group theory, but, um, but that's what it's mean by a representation. It's just a, something which transforms under, for example, rotations. A scalar is something which is invariant. Okay, that's, people use the word scalar for that. Okay. Other questions? Yeah? Please, could you recommend a book in particular um, for representations, for... You have to be a little bit more specific. A book in particular about what? Um, okay. Um, okay, the last thing I'm going to talk about today is examples of this supersymmetry. So I should say, this is um, just symbols until we give examples, okay? So, um, so why are we interested in these kinds of generalizations of the Poincaré group. So we're interested because the examples we'll find are actually interesting for physics, also for mathematics, but even for physics. So um, the first example, which we'll start tomorrow to talk about, is when, so this supersymmetry algebra, which I just erased, in four dimensions is, is what I wrote down, but you can actually do it in any dimension. So M in general, can go from 0 to d, okay? or actually d minus 1, sorry, where d is the number of space-time dimensions, not the number of spatial dimensions. Okay. So the first example, which we'll talk about tomorrow, is d equals 1. This is some kind called supersymmetric quantum mechanics. The reason why we're going to do this is two reasons. First of all, it's the easiest one to study. We don't have to know about spinners. Essentially, Q, the algebra is just Q with Q equals essentially 2P. So you only have one Q and one P. So there's only one P because M is, of course, just the value zero. So this is just equal to 2I DDT. So P is essentially just the Hamiltonian. Okay, so you can think of this as being a generalization of just ordinary quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics, of course, you just have the time direction, and you have variables depending on the time direction. But we're going to do a relativistic version of this. And this turns out to describe relativistic particle of spin half. So probably many of you have seen uh, a relativistic particle um, described by this type of action. So this would be the Lagrangian. I guess you put an M in front, maybe a C for a relativistic particle, massless particle, uh, for a relativistic particle of mass m. Okay. 
Okay, this is proportional to the length of the trajectory of the relativistic particle. And when you quantize this, it turns out to describe a scalar particle, a boson, of spin zero. You can also couple it to an electromagnetic field by just adding this term. Okay, so tomorrow we'll see that this describes first a relativistic particle of mass m in charge q moving in an electromagnetic background. And then when you supersymmetrize this, that we'll discuss tomorrow, it turns out to describe a relativistic particle of spin one-half. Okay, this time, of course, you can also describe it moving in an electromagnetic field, but now you'll see that it, this, depending on the spin of the particle, it will process um, just as an ordinary particle spin one half processes in a in a background with magnetic field. Okay, yes. Can you repeat the derivative with respect to tau? Yeah. Can you repeat the question? The derivative with respect to tau. This one, you mean? Yep. So the Lagrangian is integrated over d tau. So this would be the action. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so this is a nice example of supersymmetry. Obviously, we know that particles of spin one half exist. Um, one can ask, how do you describe their motion in an electromagnetic field? And you find that the generalization of this, if you just supersymmetrize, you get the you get the Lagrangian for spin one half. So that's very nice, um, and is convincing in the sense that it tells you that when you supersymmetrize something which is physical, you also get something which is physical. Okay. But, of course, we know how to describe spin one-half in other ways. We don't have to describe it using this way. Um. There is a question here. Yes. Uh, L is the Lagrangian. S is the action. Uh, density, okay, um, because this is just in, in one time direction. There's no spaces. There's nothing to give it a density. There's no space. Other questions? So the next example we'll do is d equals 4. And this is, of course, supersymmetric field theory. So now we're going to interpret, so now we're back to this equation we had before where these PMs are now the usual momentum. So P0 is the energy, and P1, P2, P3 are the momentum in the spatial directions. Now, it turns out that this algebra here actually has a generalization, which you can have more than one type of supersymmetry. So you can have J Sorry, uh, Nathan. I think people might be a bit confused by something on the first point. That you said d equal 1, so m would take value 0, but then you kept m in your Lagrangian. m is, oh, sorry, thank you. No, this, yeah, you're right. You, thanks for confusing. This is, should be a different kind of ladder. Let's call it um, So as I said, we're going to do this tomorrow. So. There's not too much point in, in discussing this in detail. But although it's quantum mechanics, quantum mechanics has positions, right? Okay, so you have the position of the particle um, in space-time, which depends on tau. So it's quantum mechanics in the sense that um, the things depend on t in this way, but you also have the position variables like quantum mechanics. So that's what this, maybe I should have called the capital M just to say that it's not this end. Okay, in any case, this is now the four-dimensional version. And now it turns out to be natural to allow, to have more than one type of supersymmetry. Obviously, I'm not going to ask you to give examples now, but we'll discuss this later in the course. And it turns out to it when n equals one, 
This has been studied. It's called, um, well, people call it minimal supersymmetric standard model, MSS. So people studied a generalization of the standard model of particle physics, which has all the particles that I discussed before, but which has additional particles, which are called superpartners. Why? Because they're looking for extensions to the standard model, which um, might be useful for when we find new particles in, in accelerators. Unfortunately, we haven't found new particles in the accelerators, so, um, but uh, people are obviously still looking. So this model had some nice features, so some nice features. So it predicts that the coupling constants so the standard model has three forces. So it has the uh, electromagnetic, the weak force, and the strong force. And in this minimal space-time supersymmetric version of the standard model, these coupling constants unify at a certain energy scale. So that's, um, I don't know, people like, when people say unify, people like that, okay? So the fact that they all come to the same value at some, so they, at some energy scale is a nice feature. Obviously, it doesn't have to be true, but it's a nice feature if you want to think that um, physics is unified at some high energy scale. Another nice feature of it is that it predicts a light Higgs boson. Um, not precisely at the mass scale at which it was found, but not too far away. And the third prediction is that it predicts um, superpartners. At a certain mass scale. So, this is, of course, nice. This is, of course, nice. But this, of course, we haven't seen any superpartners at any mass scale. We haven't found any evidence that there will be superpartners at higher mass scales. So this is essentially um, discouraging. Okay. So, of course, maybe the next accelerator might see these superpartners, and then everybody will be interested again in this minimal version of the supersymmetric standard model. But, okay, uh, at the moment, this third prediction certainly kills the model if we don't see any superpartners. Let me just finish what I was going to say, and then I'll ask you a question. Um, so at which mass scale? So um, unfortunately, the minimal supersymmetric standard model is very beautiful, except for one ugly feature. One ugly feature is that we know that, the that the, our universe is not supersymmetric, because this would imply that the superpartners have the same mass as their object. So there should be a photon with mass squared 0 and a photino with mass zero, which we haven't seen. Photino would be a fermionic version of the bosonic photon. So obviously, supersymmetry has to be broken. So and all of these models, which is, are extensions of the, of the physics we know, essentially don't have any nice ways to break supersymmetry. So there are, I'm not saying there are not ways to break supersymmetry, there of course are. You can just add terms which break supersymmetry. But there's no nice ways, there's no really elegant ways. And I think until we understand this, uh, I would not be convinced that, for example, um, these predictions should be taken seriously. Because the predictions obviously depend on how the supersymmetry is broken. So this mass scale, for example, uh, mass scale depends on how you break supersymmetry, and somebody may come up tomorrow with a different way to break supersymmetry, which predicts a different mass scale. So people can still write papers and say, there's supersymmetry, there's supersymmetry, I'm just going to introduce a new way to break supersymmetry, and look, um, we haven't seen this yet because I introduced a new way to break it, but essentially this goes on forever. Okay, so, um, so I think this is, although there are many people working on this, uh, there were more people working on this in the past, 
Um, for me, until they understand how to break supersymmetry, it's not so convincing. Uh, you had a question? Uh, sorry, there was another question here first. Okay, good. So please, so ask these kinds of questions because uh, superpartners are, for every particle in the standard model, which means quark, electron, photon, gluon, supersymmetry would mean that there's a superpartner. So for every boson, there's a fermion. For every fermion, there's a boson. So that's the superpartner. So you'd have to double the number of particles. Go ahead. Sorry, I s probably I said it. So the question was about the prediction of the Higgs boson. So the prediction of the Higgs boson has nothing to do with supersymmetry. It comes from the original standard model from 1965 or something like that. I don't know exactly what year. But the Higgs boson in the standard model, the mass of it is an unknown constant. And there are reasons to believe that that mass would be very heavy because of quantum effects. Now, I'm not going to try to teach you about quantum effects here because many of you do not know about field theory. But it turns out that in supersymmetric quantum field theories, the quantum effects are less, uh, they, they, they affect it less, the theory. So it predicted the Higgs boson would not be mass of the quantum uh, uh, Planck scale, but it would be mass of something around 150, 100 between 100 and 150 GeV. So, in fact, that was found. But, um, but it, as I said, it's not so convincing because the prediction depends on how the supersymmetry is broken. But it's the part that it's light that I wanted to emphasize, not the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson was predicted already. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so this is n equals 1. Uh, essentially, if you have one of these, there are other more interesting versions. So it turns out that, I'm not going to describe this in detail, but maybe in the last lecture I'll say something about, if you have n equals 2 or even n equals 4, so remember, that's just a number of supersymmetries here. It turns out that the, the field theories you get have interesting duality properties. So this is the new word, duality. And let me just give you a hint of what it means. So for example, if you discuss uh, electrodynamics, of course, there's a, there's a parameter in the theory E, right? 1 over 137. If you discuss quantum coronal dynamics, there's also a parameter in the theory, sometimes called lambda. So in general, if you have Yang-Mills, there's something called a coupling constant, which it tells, essentially tells you how strongly the theory interacts. So if lambda is zero, it means the theory is free. So for example, gluons would not interact with other gluons. Whereas if you turn on lambda, the gluons start to interact with each other, and the result is some complicated, um, some complicated theory. But it turns out that if you modify Yang-Mills to be supersymmetric with enough supersymmetry, it turns out that the theory has this duality property, that the theory with with coupling constant lambda is equal to the theory with coupling constant 1 over lambda. So that means the theory when lambda is very big is that can actually be described as the same theory with lambda very small. That turns about to be true for this n equals 4. For n equals 2, it's also, there's a similar property, but this, these are two different theories. Okay. So this is obviously interesting. Um, to mathematicians and also to physicists who want to understand theories when they are strongly coupled. Because most of our methods that we use, for example, what you'll hear about probably in the particle physics course, is based on perturb perturbation theory, when the coupling constant is very small. But of course, the coupling constant may not be small, and you still want to study the theory. So when we have supersymmetry, it turns out to be much easier to study the theory when the theory is not just perturbative. 
Okay, so that's one other motivation. So one mm. final motivation for studying supersymmetry is that it turns out, as I mentioned, quantum effects when you have a theory that's supersymmetric turns out to be easier to understand. And the current model of quantum gravity, which is most widely at least understood, is based on a theory where you have supergravity. So understood means understanding of how to do computations, amplitude computations, let me make more specific. So for scattering of gravitons. Gravitons are the, the analog of photons for gravity waves. With understanding of amplitude computation. At the moment, it seems that we need supergravity. So we need a version of supersymmetry, a, a version of general relativity in which you also have the superpartners of the graviton. Now, of course, maybe tomorrow somebody will tell us how to compute scattering amplitudes in quantum gravity without supersymmetry. But at the moment, the only, way we, the only theories of quantum gravity in which we can do amplitude computations, which come from string theory, requires supersymmetry, more specifically requires supergravity. So that's one other motivation that, um, again, it's theoretical because nobody can do an experiment yet to test quantum gravity, but at some point, maybe we'll need to know how to do tests, how to actually compute things, quantum gravity, to match with experiments. Okay, so um, I guess that's a good place to stop for the next lecture, but now, of course, the time is just open for questions. So, um, again, you can ask any kind of question. Um, go ahead. Okay, so the question is, if Berezin integration is, behaves like, integ is like a derivative, why is it called integration? Is that essentially what you want to? Um, so, in some sense, it's just language, but um, it comes from the idea that you would like to um, have integrals over both bosonic and fermionic variables. So if I think of these as bosonic, and these as fermionic, one would like to think of this as, um, as a, I mean, one would like to think of being able to integrate over all the possible trajectories of these fermionic objects. So in some sense, it's just a language, because you're right, the definition of this is more like a derivative. Um, there's another way to see why um, the roles of these are slightly different. Um, well, essentially, it's from the definition of integration. Um, so, yeah, I don't think I'm going to go there. there there's a, um, so if I have a Gaussian integration here, I'll, I'll just write down what I want to say and then... So suppose I do this kind of integration. Um, if you do the Gaussian integration for the bosons, what you find is that this goes like something like the determinant of m inverse. Or if you like, so if you do the integration over x and x bar, this goes in the denominator, whereas this goes in the numerator. So I'm not going to um, try to derive this for you. But um, in some sense, there's some, some balancing that you want to think of, that if I integrate over an equal number of bosons and fermions, then you can get a cancellation here. Um, so why you call this an integration, I think it's just language. Um, but you're right. It, um, when, you, when you try to treat this as an operation, it's actually more like a derivative. Um, questions? So the questions can be general about things you've heard about supersymmetry, um, why people were interested in the past. Yes, go ahead with the question back here. To the Higgs mass, is that what you asked? Okay, so the question is what, how does supersymmetry affect the prediction of the Higgs boson mass? So 
So that's a question, it's good for the question period because I don't think I will have time to discuss this in detail. So when you do quantum field theory and you compute these perturbative corrections, so when people do quantum field theory using um, a small coupling constant, like, so quantum field theory is very useful, for example, to compute um, electromagnetic perturbation. So because the 1 over 137 is small. Um, People try to do the same thing for quantum field theory. Um, in, in, for example, in the strong force and the weak force. And one computation you, you want to do is a computation, for example, of the Higgs mass. So, so I'm going to draw some picture, but I'm not going to try to explain what the picture is. So you have a Higgs here. This line here means there's a Higgs going in and a Higgs coming out. And these here describe some kind of process in which the Higgs decays into two particles which, the, which after join to form the Higgs. So this is some interaction process which describes a quantum correction to the mass of the Higgs. So I'm not going to try to explain why this computes the mass of the Higgs, but it's some quantum process. And here, the, the, you, can, you think of this as a loop. So that's why this is called a one-loop diagram. And the loop here can be other particles. So you can have, for example, um, let me write B and B, and then you can also have a diagram F and F. So it's the same Higgs going in and coming out. But here the Higgs, Higgs is a boson, so it can either decay into two bosons or it can decay into two fermions. Okay? So these fermions could be electrons, they could be gluons, if they're, if they're electrons, they're, of course, here. If they're gluons, they're here. Okay. And if you're doing the, uh, so if you're doing ordinary, um, so this is essentially, uh, from this, if you're doing the ordinary standard model, not the supersymmetric standard model, the mass of these bosons is different from the mass of these fermions. So this diagram here will produce some computation, which will be something like, um, let's call it A boson. So this is, a this is a contribution to the mass of the Higgs coming from bosons in this loop. This would be the contribution from fermions coming in the loop. Now, if you have supersymmetry, for each boson, you have a fermion of the same mass. And it turns out you get a cancellation between these two. So the reason for the cancellation is essentially the same thing that I told you before, that um, remember you had m inverse times dn. So when you have supersymmetry, this would come from the bosons. This would come from the fermions. And if you have supersymmetry, you get a cancellation between the two. So it turns out that for supersymmetry, for MSSM, AB plus AF equals 0. So the one-loop contribution to the Higgs for the minimal supersymmetric standard model vanishes. Now, that's if supersymmetry is not broken. Once you break supersymmetry, there are corrections, and the, and, the, and the contribution, instead of being zero, is going to be, of the, depending on how the supersymmetry is broken, might give some small contribution. But it's different from the standard model. The standard model, you find actually that this actually diverges. It's not only non-zero, it, it's infinite. So you have to put in a cutoff, and the natural cutoff is the Planck scale. So that means that if you're just doing the ordinary standard model physics, it's difficult to explain why the Higgs mass is not the same as the Planck mass. Okay? But if you have the supersymmetric version, then you get cancellation. So that's why um, it might help. But um, so that's the reason. There is a what? OK, so the question is, uh, how these two theories are the same. So in this uh, equivalence, I'm assuming that lambda does not carry any units. I don't know if that's what you're asking. So if lambda, for example, was 100, 1 over 137, then it would say that the theory when lambda is 1 over 137 is equal to the theory when lambda is 137. So when it's very, very strongly coupled, it's equal to the theory which, when it's very, very weakly coupled. That's what it would say. I don't know if that's the an that answers your question. So if lambda carries units, then, of course, you have some extra units you have to put in. 
So again, it's a fermion. So the graviton turns out to have uh, spin, spin two, and the super partner would have spin three halves, and it's called gravitino. Okay, so that's a good question. So uh, we have theories of quantum gravity in which we can compute the amplitudes theoretically, but we can't say if that theory describes our universe until we have an experiment that, that gives the answer. So we can have theories, for example, minimal supersymmetric standard model is a theory, and it gives predictions, and we can test those predictions with experiments, and so far we haven't, for example, seen the superpartner. For supergravity, we don't yet have the experiments we tested. Okay, so it's just a theory, but um, in the theory we can do computations. We just, so computations are done by humans, not by experiments. So the experiments are just to test if the computations are actually describe our universe or not. And that we don't have yet. Does that answer your question? So we can, so, oh, okay, so I, I didn't go into this, but general relativity is a well-defined theory. And the way we understand it now to do computation is classical. So, for example, gravitational waves that we, we measure in experiments are predicted by classical general relativity. As soon as we try to quantize general relativity, we find there are problems, that we don't know how to make sense out of the computations. So, essentially, we get infinities from the computations. And the only way we know how to get rid of those infinities is um, by introducing supergravity. So, that's... That's the problem, which obviously, until you know quantum field theory, I can't tell you about the infinities, but the same kind of infinities that we got here with the standard models, the Higgs boson. You have to put in a cutoff, and in the Higgs boson case, there is a natural cutoff, which is the Planck scale, because that's where quantum gravity effects come into play. But in gravity, there's no natural cutoff, because we've already, it's already quantum, so there's no higher scale. Um, It's precisely related. So the idea is that if J is 1... Can you, can you repeat the question? It, how are J and K related to more symmetries in the model? So for each of these generators, we have a symmetry. So, for example, if alpha goes from 1 to 4, and J, just goes from, if J is just 1, then you have 4 supersymmetries. If J is equal, can be 1 or 2, then we have 8 supersymmetries. So we get, for, as J increases, we have more and more symmetries. Other questions? There is a question here. S yeah, it's called supersymmetry generator. That's the name. Yeah. You have there that uh, theorem about the coupling, the coupling function uh, uh, that yes. theorem for lambda is the unit in series of one over lambda. Yes. Okay. So all of those are equal or a smaller form? So the inverse is equal or bigger form of smaller form? So, okay, so in all of the theories you described, the theories are, you have to renormalize them, which means that actually the value of the coupling constant depends on which energy scale you're measuring. So, for example, the electromagnetic coupling constant is 1 over 137 at low energies. At high energies, it becomes something different. It actually becomes very big. Um, Quantum chromodynamics is the opposite. At high energies, it actually is very small, and it's one more or less at our energy scale. So in this theory, it turns out that the energy scale, the, the coupling constant does not run. So it's a fixed value. So this is some, it's not any of the forces you described, because those are not supersymmetric. If you do the supersymmetric version of Yang-Mills, so Yang-Mills is the standard model that has some Yang-Mills. So for example, quantum chromodynamics, if you throw away the quarks, is Yang-Mills. And now if you supersymmetrize it with enough supersymmetries, then it turns out that the, that the coupling constant is not renormalized. It stays the same value. And it, it's that value that I'm, that I'm describing here, lambda. So this is not one of the four theories you described before, because those are not supersymmetric. It's something else. Okay. Other questions? 
I think maybe in view of time, so that we get time for coffee break, it will, yeah. people could uh, continue to ask questions in yeah. informally, but uh, there are there's food up here, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So let's thank Nathan. And <laughs>